This one is on the donkey. Fifteen people here. Only if two people get the benefit of my wisdom. <laughs> okay, so this one is on a, it's about the donkey that's down. So the tale goes as follows: There's a donkey that lives in a field, and there's a drought. So the donkey has to really scrape around looking for grass. Yeah, so it, whenever it finds a blade of grass, it goes and carefully eats it, and, and it survives the, the drought. And then the next year it rains a lot, and now we have lots of grass growing in the field. And then the donkey sees so much grass, gets excited, and it tries to eat the grass, and it says that part looks better, and it sort of goes to the next part of the field, and it wants to eat that. It says that part looks even better, and it keeps doing this, and it starves to death. So then the question is, why did the donkey survive during a drought and why did it die of starvation when there was plenty to go around? So the moral of the story is when there are too many opportunities, you lose focus. And when there are very little, you get more focused. Whereas it should be the opposite if you want to maximize your benefit. That's so wrong. I don't know why that's the last parable of the semester, but that's the one that I decided. What to happen next week? Next week we will, uh, yeah, maybe we can. I have sermons for next week for parables. We need more parables. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had some sermons. <laughs> there are sermons in computer science. If you haven't heard of them, we'll do next week. Thanks for sermons. <laughs> So we have, uh, I want to finish this and then the next topic is going to be cloud computing and virtualization, but we have some material to finish off on file systems. So just to recap, we, start, we talked uh, about distributed file systems last time. Okay, so we were talking about variety of issues in distributed file system. We looked at naming in particular. How are file names constructed when the file is remote? Okay, we said you can have name, uh, names could be location transparent, which means the path name for that file, the full path name, does not reveal the location of the file. It has no information about the server that it's stored on. That's called location transparent. Or you can not have location transparent, which means the path name has to somehow embed the server name as well. Okay, so you can have different naming schemes in different kinds of file systems. Uh, then we talked about how that the file system is actually constructed in terms of uh, how it accesses data. So he said there are two models, remote access model, which basically says that every read or write request from the local machine is sent off to the remote machine, okay, the remote server. So it's sent as an RPC request, the remote server performs a read or write and sends back the result. That's called remote access. The other model is what ca is called caching oriented, where the first time you open the file, you bring the entire file over, you cache it locally, and all subsequent reads or writes are actually local reads or writes to the cached copy. Okay? And if you're performing writes on the file, every once in a while, you can send the writes over, or not the writes, but the updated version of the file over, so that you're synchronized with respect to the search. Okay? So there are these two issues we talked about whenever you have caching, you have to ensure consistency of the file because if you modify it locally, the master copy on the server is out of date, it's stale. Okay, so cache consistency protocol ensures that eventually or in some fashion your changes go back to the server. There are different, uh, there's an entire body of research on what is the right cache consistency technique. Okay, we talked about a few where I said you could be, you could put the responsibility on the server whenever the client changes a file, locally in the, the cached copy, it sends a notification to the server. The server tracks all the machines that have cached copies and it sends them uh, invalidate messages saying your copy is now out of date, do not use it anymore. Okay, that's the server oriented approach. The client oriented approach, the server doesn't do anything, it's the responsibility of the client to decide when and how frequently it sends all the updates. If every update is sent, if every write is sent, that becomes what a write back caching. We talked about write back and write through. So that's write back caching. It's uh, better in terms of consistency, lower performance because every write has to be sent to the server. Uh, sorry, it's write through caching, not write back caching. Okay, so it's write through, so writes actually go through the cache all the way to the server. Okay? 
if you actually only perform local writes and send the updates periodically, you have write back. Yeah. So all writes are local, they are faster, better performance as a result, but the master copy and other cached copies may be potentially out of date for a while. Okay, so there is a consistency performance trade-off in this case. In one case you get better performance, in another case you get better consistency. Okay, so you have to make these design decisions whenever you have to design any distributed file systems uh, that employs this form of caching. Okay, so, so I also talked about stateful versus stateless server. This also depends on whether the caching is server initiated or client initiated. If it's the job of the server, then the server has to keep track of all the machines that have stored copies of the file, that state that you're keeping in the server. Okay? If you're client initiated caching, you will have stateless server. Okay? So that's a quick recap. Now let's examine these issues in the context of a real file system. But, uh, we will actually look at NFS, Sun's Network File System. Okay? So this is a standard for uh, uh, for most Unix file system, I mean Unix operating systems. Okay, so practically any flavor of Unix that you can install will have NFS support built in. Okay, so if you want to take any disk on a Unix machine and share the files on another machine, you essentially use NFS. Okay, it's been almost 25, 30 years since NFS was first designed. It was designed originally to run on LAN. Yeah, so original versions of NFS, which is NFS version 1, version 2, they all ran over UDP. Yeah, so basically, uh, if you know what UDP is, it basically it's a transport protocol that does not deal with packet losses. Okay? If you are designed to run on a LAN, packet losses are rare because your LAN is either a gigabit, and now it's gigabit. In those days, it was 10 or 100 megabit Ethernet, relatively fast not a whole lot of uh, load on the network, packets don't get lost, it's okay to run over UDP. Okay, eventually people started running NFS even over WAN. So you could mount volumes that are stored on remote machines that are not on your local area network somewhere else. Okay? In that scenario, you actually need to ensure that if packets get lost, then there is something has to be done about it. So uh, more uh, recent versions of NFS actually run over TCP. And TCP as a transport protocol actually handles packet losses automatically. Okay? The reason this is important is NFS is designed to run our RPC, remote procedure call. So imagine you're making a remote, calling a remote procedure and your packet just gets lost in the network. The method call never reaches the server. Okay? Now you have a problem. You sent off a read or a write request, there is no response. So either you have to then have a uh, code at the server or the client which says I'm going to wait for so long and time out and if I don't receive a response I'm going to retry assuming the packet was lost. So then you have to deal with additional complexity in the client code which makes the client more complex. On the other hand if you just use TCP, TCP will do the retransmissions for you. It will detect when packets are lost, it will retransmit so this, the application code or the file system code is simpler. It can just assume that once you send off of a request it will get there eventually, but TCP will take care of it for you. Okay. So depending on the proto choice of protocol, there is there are design implications on what to write in your application code. Okay. So the default version that you see today is NFS version 3. Okay. The version number is sort of meaningless, but this just says it's the third generation of the NFS protocol. Yes. So what do you mean by having state versus state in all the states? Okay. What does state mean? State, this is a concept in distributed systems. Uh, so state essentially means if you keep track of something about clients, the server keeps track of some information about clients, okay, that information is referred to as state. Okay? So in, uh, in the case of caching, if you have to keep track of which clients are actually keeping a copy of the file, a file in the cache, that is state that the server is maintained. Typically, the state is maintained in memory, which means if the server or the OS reboots for any reason, state disappears. Okay. Okay. So, other questions or concepts that I may have glossed over. So, these are all important to understand. State is actually a very fundamental concept in distributed system. Whenever you write an application, you have to decide 
what state will you maintain, whether you will maintain state and so on. In this case, the, the, the server has to figure out what information about clients should it keep track of, okay, that state that it will keep track of. Any other questions? So that brings us to the next point, which is uh, about state itself. So until NFS version 3, okay, the server was designed to be stateless. The server kept track of no information about clients whatsoever. It did not even keep track of which files are open. Okay? So typically on a normal operating system, if your process opens a file, okay, we will have a file descriptor table in the kernel which keeps track of all the files that are open. We talked about this when we did file system. So the OS actually has state. That's a file descriptor table. So the process control block is state about processes. That's information about processes. So the OS is stateful. So it's keeping track of what processes are running, what files are open and so on. NFS version 3 on the other hand was stateless. It, so the server did not actually keep track of what clients are accessing, what files, what files are open and so on. Okay. What that meant was that for every read or write request, you have to re-authenticate with the server and actually provide a file handle saying I have privileges to open the file. Because the re request had to be rechecked. So, so do you have to change the ACLs on the server itself before you can actually like, change the metadata of a file? Or can you do that on your remote machine? Okay. So you are asking about access control lists and so on. So NFS, I should mention that I'll show you a figure in just a minute. NFS is a layer that runs on top of a typical file system. Okay. So we'll assume the, the way this works is you have a local file system on a machine. Think of NFS as a software layer that runs on top that allows you to share these files on your local file system with another machine. So nothing has changed as far as the local file system is concerned. Yeah, so your question about ACLs is related to what's happening in the local file system. NFS doesn't require you to make any change on the local file system. In fact, NFS is designed to run on a very large number of file systems. It even runs on fat file systems. Okay, it runs on, so it, NFS doesn't actually make assumptions about what, what file system you have underneath. You can have whatever, you can have NTFS, you can have EXT3 Linux, you can have Apple's HFS, doesn't matter. It's a layer that runs on top. It allows you to take those files and share them on another machine. Okay. So nothing has changed. The state is as far as the NFS, what is maintained in that NFS layer. It doesn't change anything about the underlying file system. Okay. So the point is, until NFS version 3, they made a fundamental decision to keep the server stateless. Servers were simple, because they didn't have to keep track. Clients had to be more complex. Okay. Clients had to do more work in order to make read requests there to send more information and so on. Okay? Starting NFS version 4, which is the latest version of uh, the NFS protocol, the server is now stateful. Okay? This allows you to do interesting things like you can actually take a lock on the file. Okay? Why is that important? Locking is actually very important uh, in many applications. So in your email application, for instance, uh, the way email actually works is whenever, whenever mail arrives into your inbox, your uh, mail daemon, typically SMTP or send mail, actually takes a lock on the file. Okay? And then it adds that incoming message to the file. Your inbox is actually a shared buffer. Okay? This is essentially a standard producer-consumer problem. Your clients are consuming data from the mailbox. Your mail uh, daemon is actually adding incoming mail to your mailbox. And this is a shared buffer. Okay? So just as we studied here that you have to take locks on the shared buffer, and this is exactly how mail works. So mail actually has to take a lock. Because if you try to start deleting mail messages while new mail is being added, your inbox will be corrupted. So you are trying to read, two processes are trying to write to the file at the same time and you will corrupt the file. Okay, and your mail messages will get lost. Okay, now why am I telling you all this? This basically says to implement mail correctly, you actually need locking functionality in the file system. Okay. If you have a stateless network file system, by definition you cannot have locks because locks require state about is the lock and, uh, free or taken. That state of the lock. And NFS version until version 3 refused to keep any state on the server. So which meant you could not do locking with NFS. That also meant that if you have NFS directories, you couldn't run mail properly on it. Once in a while you will see that your mail will become corrupt. So if you actually go and look at the documentation of any 
mail server or IMAP client, it will tell you that don't run IMAP over NFS, it may potentially corrupt your inboxes. Okay? Now all that problems have gone away because they made NFS version state, version 4 stateful, which meant that you could actually implement locking now in the server and which meant you can now do all these things that you couldn't do before. Yes, question. This is kind of weird, but like, so you said that the, it's independent of whatever operating system or, you know, file system the client's using. Yep. Um, what about the server? Okay, so I'll talk a little bit. So, so the way NFS is designed, it's a, it's a specification. It is, does not, it's written so that it does not depend on node homogeneity. The clients and servers could be independent platform. You can have, a, the, the other day I was showing you my machine which was actually <coughs> mounting a network volume from another machine. That machine was running Linux and is running Mac, okay? Independent platform. So most distributed file systems are designed with heterogeneity in mind. They assume, do not assume that the client and the server are on the same OS, same platform. You can mount a Windows NTFS share over NFS if you actually run NFS on your Windows machine. Yeah. And the client could be a Mac or a Linux machine, and vice versa. You can have a Linux machine exporting NFS files that you access from a Windows box. Yeah. So it's designed for heterogeneity. Yeah, because all you're doing is you can allow sharing protocol. Yes. So I guess my question then is like, where is the protocol actually implemented? Okay, so we'll sh I'll show you a picture to explain how it is implemented. So hold off on that because we have, I was just explaining the concept, implementation details are coming. So there's a file system virtualization uh, layer on top of the system's file system for all the communication. Yes, we, not called a virtualization layer, but yes, there okay. is a layer. It's so called a virtual layer. Does that get from the NFS onto the actual computer's OS? Okay, so maybe the both of your questions are in sort of similar. Maybe I can show you the picture and that is explained. How it's implemented. Okay, so this is basically uh, implementation of, not implementation, this is the file subsystem, file system uh, uh, as part of the kernel. Okay? Uh, that's your system call interface, that's where read, write, all of those requests come in. There is in, if this is the way it's done in Linux, Windows is slightly different. Okay, so there is this layer called a virtual file system switch. Okay? And what this does is whenever a read or write request comes in, it checks what kind of file is this read or write request for. Okay? And then it will send it to the right code in the kernel. The kernel can actually support a number of file systems at the same time. So you could put in a CD-ROM and that's an ISO file system. FAT, or you can have a, a FAT uh, USB drive, you can have EXT3. There's code for lots of different file systems already loaded in the kernel. So you'll have, here I'm showing you two file systems. There's a local file system called UFS and then there is the NFS. Okay? But you could have many of these here. You can have ext3 and so on. So what this layer does is think of it as a forwarding layer. It says every time a read or write request comes, it says what kind of file system is this file sitting on? And it will send that request to the right, right code for that file system in the kernel. And that part, that's almost like a device driver. Okay? Not really a device driver, but think of it as a module that implements different file systems. Okay? And then that file system will uh, that code will actually handle that read or write request according to whatever uh, is being requested. Okay? So that's this layer, virtual file system. So let's now ignore that there are many file systems. Let's assume there are only two, a local file system and NFS. Okay? So the way this works is as follows. So if you make a local request for a local file, comes to the file system interface, comes to the virtual file system so, uh, is a layer that hands it to the local file system code that just goes directly to the disk. We are done at the moment. Okay? Now, if on the other hand you're accessing a file that is an NFS mounted file, if that's you're accessing a remote file, the path is going to be fast for you. Make a OS call, okay? a read call, let's say, comes to the virtual file system, so it hands it to NFS. Okay? Now, NFS will figure out what server is this uh, file resident on. It will construct an RPC request and send that off to the server. So basically, and the server also looks exactly the same. Okay, so let's say the client request arises from to the server. The NFS server code looks at it. Okay, it sends it back up here. 
Okay. And then that comes back down to the local file system for handling, because you are after all accessing a local file on that server. That file, that file will be accessed. It will go back here to the NFS server code, which will send back a response to the RPC request. Yes. So, um, so this wouldn't really cover like client to client communication. Right? How do you mean client to client? So like if you wanted to get like say if I don't know if this applies or not, but if you have two clients connected to one server and you're trying to get files from another client as opposed to getting it on the server somewhere, is that like is that still covered by NFS? So you have two clients that are connected to the server. Each client will do that. Okay? If this client wants to access files from that client, this client actually becomes a server in that case. Okay? So the machine can be a client and a server at the same time. It can be accessing files on other machine. For those files, it's a client. It can be providing uh, files to other machine. For those files, it's a server. So this machine can access files on this, uh, uh, this other machine. And for those files, this machine becomes the server, and this machine becomes the so the role of client and the server depends on what files are you accessing and where the files are stored. And a machine can be both at the same time. You don't have to be one or the other. Then you had a question. Is that answered here? This is um, yeah, I sort of have a branching question. Okay. So um, on the disk, are, is the disk partition for different file type, um, like does it have an, an, an NFS file type partition and a UFS file type partition? No. So NFS is not really a file type in the file system. This is just a piece of software. Okay. You only have a local file system and your file disk is formatted for that file system. So it just handles parsing. Right. This, exactly. So this, think of this as a layer that sits on top. Although this year I have not shown it as being on top because this is what the code looks like. But conceptually, NFS, so the way to think about this, this is disk. You have a local file system. Okay, and the disk is formatted for the local file system and NFS is a layer that sits on top that just allows you to take these files and make them available on the other machine. So nothing changes here. You're not reformatting this for NFS. There's no such concept. Okay. It is just a protocol, RPC based protocol that allows you to request files from another disk from another machine. Okay. Yes. You just caps large files, things like that, so that you can work with a broader spectrum of files. So like a four gig bit, uh, but in case of like fat going to many other. Right. So uh, as it turns out, so you're asking about what does it do with respect to file limits and so on. So the protocol is written to be platform independent. Okay? So there are many things that are not required by the protocol. The protocol, NFS protocol does not specify anything about there is there a file size, no file size. That is basically governed by whatever local file system you have. And if the local file system has constraints, NFS cannot do anything to overcome those constraints. It will expose the same constraint outside. Right? So if you are running NFS over FAT, and FAT has a 4 GB limit, and you try to write a file to uh, NF to that file system over NFS, after 4 GB, NFS will start throwing errors, saying I cannot write it because local file system will accept it. That's all it will do. It won't change anything to what the local file system is. Okay, just as I said, just a layer that takes any local file system and allows you to access those files on another machine. Okay, so that's implementation. Here are some other points that I wanted to make. LFS is all RPC based. Okay, so all the things you are doing about client server program, same thing is actually done by NFS. In fact, the first implementation of RPCs was originally put into the OS for implementing NFS. Okay, very early on, uh, Solaris, which was Sun's operating system, in those days it was called Sun OS, okay, implemented RPCs, but for the purpose of writing the first version of NFS. And since they had already built those tools, they also exported them to programmers or developers to write other RPC applications. But this is the reason RPCs even came into conventional Unix like operating system okay, as a standard feature. Yeah, so all RPC works. Also, basically, every system call, open, read, write, close, all of those translate to RPC calls or NFS. Okay? I did not actually show you the list of NFS calls, but there's a reasonable mapping for every file operation that you can perform. There's a corresponding NFS call or a set of calls that allows you to implement that function. Yes. So I'm assuming that like NFS is kind of portable, like Java is. Like you had to 
Like what I'm wondering is if they have to make like a separate client for each operating system or right. so the the specification of NFS is highly portable because it doesn't make any assumptions about the platform or the underlying file system. It is designed to run on the large, uh, large number of underlying file systems. The implementation of NFS, which is different from the spec, all that the NFS designers have done is they have written a document which says this is what NFS uh, RPC calls look like. Anyone can take that document and implement their own NFS client. Right? So now each OS designer or government designer has to take that spec and if I support NFS in my operating system, I have to write something in the kernel that basically accepts this API. So that's the way it works. So, so implement it. there are many, many implementations. In fact, there are many implementations for the same OS sometimes. You can get an NFS model, a commercial one from someone who's optimized for performance and you can get a free one and so on. Okay. Any other questions? So, so a set of implemented using RPCs, as I already said, doesn't make any assumptions about homogeneity. Clients and servers can run different platforms, they interoperate, because NFS is designed to do that. Okay, and uh, depending on how NFS is set up, as I was mentioning last time, it uses this mount protocol that allows you to export whatever subdirectories you want to make available on another machine. Okay, and then on another machine, you basically the equivalent amount which is like importing it. It says I want to take this subdirectory or this volume from the server and mount it locally. Okay, and now the, the, this is up to the administrator to decide which server should you allow access from, where do you mount it on your local file system tree and so on. Okay? And there is no requirement that different machines all do it the same way. You can configure each machine differently depending on what files you are going to make available, where do you mount it and so on. Any other questions on this? So that's just a quick three slide uh, case study of NFS. Okay, so in that case, we will go back to today's lecture, which is data centers and cloud computing. So I'm going to uh, briefly describe what are data centers. And then we'll talk a little bit about virtualization, because that's both integral to data centers and cloud. And depending on how much time we have, we'll start the discussion on cloud. We may not all get through it today. So let's start with what is a data center. Okay. So to understand what's a data center, you should know what a server is. A okay. server is basically a machine that provides some service. Okay. Typically, there are so these are sort of hardware boxes that have uh, more memory, maybe faster processors, more network capacity so that they can handle lots of clients. Okay, you can get these rack mount machines okay, that will basically run uh, server applications on. Okay. A data center is essentially a large machine room. Okay, it's a room that, or not a room, or it's a facility that essentially houses lots and lots of these servers okay, and, and storage as well. Okay, typical data centers may have uh, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands servers. And many, many cores. They may have so the total storage capacity may be in petabytes. Okay. So large facilities that allow you to uh, <coughs> house all of your server applications on this uh, on the, in this facility. So they are also referred to as server farms in some cases. Okay. So there, who are who uses data centers? They are used by companies. Okay. So most of the companies will put all of their large applications into a data center, whether it's mail servers whether it's all of their enterprise applications that run payroll or, or financial applications, all of them essentially run on data center. Most of the services that you use today, yeah, there is some data center somewhere that is hosting them, whether it is something like Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Google, all of those services, right, they basically are running on some server farm somewhere, more than one in many cases. So, and these are large number of servers that collectively provide that service. As I was uh, saying, the largest data centers are actually built by uh, companies that run these very large scale global services. Okay, whether it's Google or Amazon or Facebook, typical data or even Microsoft. Typical Google data center would have more than 100,000 servers. Okay, so think of, uh, and the, the amount of, just the amount of electricity you need 
to just power that data center is enough to power a small city. So that's the amount of electricity or energy that the data centers actually take up. Yeah. Used to a variety of things, data processing, websites, business applications. So there are some figures here. So here is a picture of what uh, inside of a data center looks like. So these are racks. Yeah, each of this is a server on the rack and then there are cables that are going from it. You can just see aisles and aisles of these racks. That's so when you go into one of these data centers, you basically see so racks or servers or storage and disk. Okay. And the important thing is these servers generate a lot of heat. Okay. When they're all on, they're going to be generating heat. So the important aspect of data center is you have special cooling system that basically are designed to just cool this facility. And that is where uh, also a lot of the energy actually goes in. So, and then since these run applications that sometimes you cannot afford to have go down, okay, you will have lots of backup system. You will have UPSs on the servers, you will have backup diesel generators if the electricity count fails, uh, fails and so on. Okay. So these things are expensive to build. Okay, so I'll show you an example. So this is the new the data center that just opened up in Holio. Okay, this was actually built by a consortium of universities, any mass blue one of them, Harvard, MIT, BU, Northeastern. So these universities came together and built this data center. It actually opened uh, two weeks ago. Okay. It's built in Holio. That costs 150 million. So and that's not with, with no computers, that's just the shell. And okay. not one machine in there. Okay. That's just the amount of so that is essentially uh, the entire infrastructure to power. So this is basically, uh, that's the electricity, the room that basically does all the electrical supplies okay, to all the racks. Okay, so there's a large room which is uh, just cables that are just going to all the racks. Okay. This is the cooling system. Okay, that pipe, it may look big, but it's really big. You can actually uh, stand inside. That's about eight feet in diameter. Okay, that's where cold air is actually going in. Okay, so these are all the chillers. So the amount of heat that's generated is tremendous when you have the whole system loaded up. So each of these pipes is about four or five feet wide. And that's where they actually send the air to cool the thing and bring hot air out and so on. Okay, if you can see this, which I think is really dark, it looks better there. So these are the aisles of machines, okay, which is currently empty. Uh, but these are, so that's basically where the servers sit. But all of this infrastructure is built around it. There are diesel generators that I didn't show you here. So what do we use for? <laughs> What is it going to be used for? So they will house machines that our research groups will actually buy and put in there. Okay, so most research groups will act have computational needs. So they have their own clusters. Okay. Right now each of each group has its own small room somewhere where you put in a small wrap or two. This is a central facility where you can just go and put them because every time you have a small room you have to have special air conditioner to heat it because the regular cooling system can't. You put a rack in this room the room temperature will go to 90 Fahrenheit in a matter of hours. So this air conditioning is not designed to handle that level of heat. Yeah, so, so it's expensive to build these small rooms. It's actually, although it looks like a lot of money, doing it this way is cheaper in the long run. I was just going to say, it might be easier to see if you can kill the middle ones. Yeah, so this is what you So that's again the electrical thing. These two are the, the pipes for chillers, and this is our machine room. That's what the facility looks like from outside. Yeah. Just an example of, uh, and this is a small facility, okay, 20 megawatts. And to actually take Google's facilities, like uh, there was a picture which I meant to bring, but I forgot. It's like the size of a uh, few soccer fields. Okay. It's like a very large facility where all you do is have aisles and aisles and aisles of machines and you know, all equipment to cool these machines. So that's how data centers have been built. This one is actually built to be extremely energy efficient. The one that just opened here, uh, it basically takes uh, three watts of cooling for, uh, not for uh, every uh, 10 watts of power that the server takes. Okay, so you need 30% of the power is going into cooling for every watt of uh, which are you need to generate. Typical data center take one watt for every watt of heat generated. They are very inefficient. Okay, so you need 
power. So every time you have a one watt being consumed by power, you need another watt to actually cool it. So you have double your electricity. Yeah, so this one actually is much more efficient. Okay. Here's a different way to build data centers. Okay. So that is actually a schematic of, uh, I believe, a Microsoft data center. Okay. This one is called a modular data center. So these are like Lego blocks. So this thing is actually, a, so this is, uh, so it's all outdoors, so there's no facility in here. So this is a 20 feet uh, container. It is like, the, think of it as the uh, container that you see on these 18 wheelers. Okay. The machines are actually inside this container. So you can now buy an entire container filled with machines from the server companies. Okay, so they, instead of shipping you one machine, they'll just ship you a container which is sort of pre-built and populated with machines. And the plan, the, so the goal, so all you have is a chiller here. So when this container comes in, there is nothing to build it, pre-built. So you just have to supply it power, network, and cooling. Okay, so it has a the thing where you plug in the power, there's a thing where you plug in the network, and then you basically are went to sort of supply cold air and then it's all taken care of. So you don't have to do anything. Right? So for companies that keep building these data centers, they are actually going into this modular model where they just, rather than buying servers and then trying to go and populate them into racks and doing all of this, they will just basically get one container and plug it. Okay, so that's the, the new way of designing this what they call plug and play modular data centers. So it's all outside as you can imagine. There's actually a picture on YouTube of uh, all this, uh, I think that's a big data center. That's a picture of actually a container. There's a two containers stacked on top of it. Okay. So this is just to give us example of uh, what kinds of infrastructure that you see when you talk to <laughs> client server application, then server applications here are this very large application. Like questions on this. So that's data centers. Now, uh, to understand, so cloud computing is basically, you have to understand two concepts, what are data centers and what's virtualization. So I'm going to talk a little bit about virtualization now. And then we'll put both of those concepts together and talk about clouds. Okay. So here, uh, we'll start with the definition of what is virtualization. And we'll see why we have to understand both of them. Okay, so the definition of it is very simple. Okay, so it basically says uh, virtualization allows you to extend or replace uh, an existing interface to mimic the behavior of another system. Okay, so here's an example of virtualization. So let's suppose you have either a hardware or software A okay, that has some interface or some API that is used by some process. Okay. Now if you basically have a hardware or software system B that has a different interface. When you write a layer on top of that interface that mimics this interface A, that is referred to as virtualization. It is essentially a virtualized A. It's simply implementation of one interface on top of another interface. That's the basic definition of what is virtualization. So now let's try to understand what all this means. So this was this concept was designed in the 1970s. Uh, by IBM, as it turns out, when it was building its series of mainframes. And the reason they came up with this notion was, basically they had this line of products, and then they came up with a better architecture for their mainframe. Okay? They built a new operating system for their mainframe. Okay? And when you do this, and some customer of yours actually buys this new uh, large mainframe, none of their old code will run. The hardware has changed, architecture has changed, processor has changed, the OS has changed, the code is not going to run. You can't take Linux code and run it on Windows without any changes. Okay. So, uh, so basically if they came up with this idea saying if either your customer will say I don't want this because I cannot take all of the applications are built and now redo them. So I need a way to run them. So what they said is okay you buy this hardware, we will give you a software that runs on top of it, which tries to emulate the old hardware and the old interface. Okay. So all old applications that you have, you run on the old interface, that's a layer that runs on my new box, and they'll run exactly the same way. And when you write new applications, you can write them to the new hardware and the new operating system. Okay. So this allows you to maintain compatibility with all older applications. Okay. Or at least that was the rationale for designing this. 
and yet you can build new applications with uh, uh, and take advantage of the new features. And that was the reason they actually did. So basically, the way they did is they uh, so here the system B is your new machine. The interface of B is the new system called interface from the OS. And uh, basically, that virtualization layer is mimicking the old hardware and in fact the old instruction set on the old processor. And the uh, interface it's exposing is basically the inter APIs or the system called interface of the old machine. Okay, so that's basically how virtualization came about, uh, like almost 40 years old concept. And for many years, that's all it was used for. And people who bought mainframes didn't have to rewrite code. These are old big banks and insurance companies that are still running code that are developed in the 70s, okay, even today. As it turns out. Okay, simply because they don't have to rewrite it. <coughs> now, as a concept, it is much, the, today it's much broader than that. Okay, you use virtualization for much more than keeping mainframe code compatible with old hardware. Okay, so, as I said, the definition is more general. It just says, I have one interface that is basically emulating another interface. So, uh, so that base concept can be applied in many, many different ways. So the interface, depending on what interface you have, you have different kinds of virtualization. The interface you are emulating is a library interface. You have application level virtualization. The interface you are emulating is hardware, just raw hardware. You basically have a hardware level virtualization. If you are in, uh, emulating system calls, you have OS level virtualization, and so on and so forth. So, so you basically can emulate assembly instructions, you can emulate system calls, you can emulate APIs. Okay, and you'll have virtualization at different layers. Okay, so you can have OS level, application level, and so on. Okay, here are some examples. Okay, so application level virtualization, as it turns out, you already used. Okay, Java is an example of an application level virtualization. The JVM essentially is a virtualization layer that exposes the Java API using whatever uh, uh, platform it is running on. Okay, so. So you have essentially, if you write Java code on some JVM, it will run on any other platform that runs that same JVM unmodified. Okay? Not very different from what was being done on this main thing, because the underlying platform may have completely changed. In this case, your virtualization layer is the JVM. The interface A is the, is the Java API, okay, and it is running on some arbitrary underlying platform, whether Linux or Windows, in this case, is not material because the virtualization layer has abstracted that out. Okay? That's an example of an application layer virtualization. Okay? I don't know if any of you heard of Rosetta. Yes. So Rosetta was a technology that Macs actually implemented when they switched from power PCs to x86 architecture a few years ago. Okay? And the same issues came up. There are lots of people invested in Macs. They were running all these power PC applications, and they, my Apple decided to switch from power PCs to x86. And people said, "What about my application? If I buy your new Mac, all my old applications are now not going to run." Okay. So what Apple did is they, with every version of OS X, that the new version, they shipped this technology called Rosetta. Okay. What Rosetta did is uh, it's, it's sat basically as a layer in the OS. What it did is it took power PC core and ran it unmodified on x86 machines. Okay. It did binary translation of assembly instructions. Okay. So what, you could just run a PowerPC application, you could basically start executing assembly PowerPC instructions okay, with different architecture, different CPU altogether. And what Rosetta was doing is underneath, every instruction was being translated to a corresponding x86 instruction. <coughs> and so you could run essentially the code unmodified. Now, the most recent version of OS X just removed uh, support for Rosetta, but until I think uh, Lion or at least until Snow Leopard, I believe Rosetta was already there. So you could take Power PC apps and just run them, and you would not even know that you are actually running a Power PC app. It looks exactly the same. It looks like a standard application. You double click, it just runs. It's just underneath. It runs a little slower because there's a translation going on. Another form of virtualization. And if you've heard of Wine, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so Wine is another form of application virtualization which implements the Win32 API on some other platform. 
Okay, so in this case, you are taking the live uh, Win32, which is the Windows API, okay, and you run it on a different platform. So this allows you to run Windows apps okay, on Linux or Macs or some other machine because they are uh, making Win32 calls, and then Wine is translating them underneath to whatever the local platform does, okay, form of translation. Okay. So all of this, as you can imagine, all of these layer, virtualization uh, layers essentially are doing translation underneath. They expose one API and they translate it to another API. And the, they try to do it transparently, so whatever is running on top, you can know that it's actually you're running this or that process on some other machine. Okay. So those are all technologies that you probably heard of. And uh, what we will actually talk about here is not application level virtualization, rather we look at what's called worse level virtualization. Okay, that's the one that uh, typically it is used in data centers. Okay, so here are two pictures just to show you what OS level virtualization essentially does. Okay, this is probably something you may actually be familiar with. Uh, if you run either VMware or VirtualBox on your machine, this is what's happening under the hood. Okay? So you have what's called a host operating system. That's the OS that's running on your let's say, laptop or desktop. You run a virtual virtualization layer on top of that. Okay, this is referred to as a type 2 virtualization. You don't have to go into what type 1 and type 2 is for this class. Let's just think of it as a virtual virtualization layer. And what this virtualization layer does is it emulates an entire PC, an x86 machine in software. And because it emulates an entire x86 machine in software, you can actually run another operating system on top of that virtualization. Because you can run one OS on top of another. And if you then start that OS, then you can actually run arbitrary applications that run on that OS. Okay. So this, uh, this uh, is typically used for development environments or if you want to run, uh, let's say, Linux on, on another platform and so on, and I'll show you an example. That is different from what is actually done in servers on most servers. In servers, you have a virtualization layer that actually runs on bare metal. Okay, that is the think of that as the kernel for the machine. Okay, you basically boot up a type one virtual machine uh, hypervisor. Hypervisor is just the, the piece of software that implements virtualization, and that allows you to create what a virtual <coughs> machine, okay, just as you create them here. Yeah. So these are emulated PCs, and then inside each you can run whatever OS you want. Like there is Windows or Linux and so on. And you can run multiple of them on the same machine, just as you can on your PC as well. Okay? So let me just show you an example. So, So I have two virtual machines here. Yeah, this is VMware's uh, Fusion. So I'm just booting up Ubuntu, not booting up, but just resuming Ubuntu, which is a virtual machine that's running on my Mac. So as Linux inside of emulated PC, which is running on top of my Mac. So when you see that is booted up, then you can start whatever you want. Because I just created a folder, I can give it whatever name, so I can start up process, you know, file Mozilla is starting up, Firefox. So this is all running as Linux processes inside a Linux OS, which is Ubuntu, which is running on a virtual machine. Okay. Just as an example of, that is an example of uh, this case. Okay, so you have Uh, host OS, in this case that's OS X. Okay, this type 2 hypervisor that's VMware Fusion. Okay. And then the guest OS was Linux. Okay, so I could run Linux inside uh, a virtual machine on Linux. Okay. 
just as an example. This, this kind of virtualization is typically used for development. If you are using uh, your machine to do code development for another platform, you don't need to get a separate machine to run that OS. You can just run that on You can run Windows 8, for instance, on Mac OS X in this fashion. Yes? Oh, yes. Um, so can you, like, can you give me an example of, like, the, uh, the diagram of the lab? Type 1 virtualization. So, uh, probably uh, unless you actually worked in data centers, you would not see this. So there are many companies that build this. Okay, so I'll show you some example. So the VMware also built Type 1 hypervisor. It cost a lot more money than just buying a Fusion. It got thousands of dollars for it. Okay, a, they, they have weird names for them. I, think I can tell you. It's called ESX server, for instance. Right? So, so basically, what that is, is a VMware kernel that will boot up on the machine. Okay? You can create virtual machines on them, okay? and then you can run it. Okay? And most data centers will have them because you may have 8, 16 core servers. You don't need to run one entire OS. You can actually run more than one. Okay? And that's how uh, you can make better use of your data center resources. You have something? Oh, I was just going to say, like, ESXi is the one. questions here. So, so with that background, that's a digression of virtualization, let's come back to data center. So the way these most of the data centers run is they don't necessarily just run one OS on a machine, they actually are virtualized. They run a type 1 uh, virtual machine layer and then they run multiple OSs or multiple virtual machine. Okay, so, so you can take a physical machine and slice them into smaller virtual machines and then run uh, whatever you want on inside those virtual machines. So I think this is basically showing you uh, a physical server, okay? virtualization layer, which is type 1 virtualization, like VMware, ESX, and so on. And here you have an example of virtual machine 1 and virtual machine 2. Each of this is, think of it as an emulated version of the underlying server. Okay? So, uh, so the nice thing about this is, because this is an emulated machine, you can do things that you could never do on a physical server. Okay, you can dynamically increase the amount of memory that is allocated to this virtual machine, for instance. Okay, by just taking whatever you have here as being partitioned. So if you have 16 GB here, you could give 8 GB and 8 GB. Or you can say, I, this machine is more, so I'm going to give it 10 and give this 6. You can do some of these adjustments on the fly. You can take 16 cores and give 6 cores here and 10 cores and you can keep changing them okay? without even having to reboot some, in some cases. Okay? You could never do this on a physical, you can't actually go and put more RAM on, on a server and say I don't have to reboot those. That just isn't done. Yes? Yeah, I was just going to say, how does, it, how does it do that like in real time? Well, for that we have to go into how virtualization works, which we will not do here. Right? So you have to understand what is inside this layer and how you can slice it in different ways. And that's really material for a graduate level course. It would take two, three lectures just to explain that. It's not a simple concept. Okay. So, so that's, that's one thing you can do, change the amount of resources, which is what is mentioned here. The other thing you could do, which also you couldn't do otherwise, is uh, virtual machines, uh, not virtual machines, virtualization layers allow you to actually move a virtual machine from one server to another without shutting down the application. So if, for instance, this machine gets overloaded, so there's too much load of it, you can take this VM and say move it to another host. Okay? And then the virtualization layer will actually take this OS and all the processes running on it and just move the whole thing to a different server. Okay? Without even the server, or without even the OS or application knowing about it. They don't even go down. This is all happening live. So you can do uh, uh, optimizations like this, which of course you couldn't do if you wouldn't have virtualization. Right? So this is often how uh, companies can, like Google and so on can actually deal with occasional increases in workload and so on and not have to take the service down to make adjustments and you can actually do this using virtualization technology. So this, what I just described is what is called VM migration, virtual machine migration, where you move virtual machines from one server to another. Okay. 
So here's a small animation that shows that that virtual machine moved because the soul got overloaded, and this is actually can be done live. Okay, so just a few examples of virtual machine uh, product companies. Uh, VMware, I already mentioned, there's one called Parallels, uh, it's open source ones. In Linux, a lot of the virtualization is basically handled by two different hypervisors. There's KVM, Kernel Virtual Machine, and there is Zen. These are the two that are implemented in Linux. Okay, so if you have a Linux box, you can enable uh, either Zen or KVM, you can build your own virtual machine. It's not fairly straightforward. There's another one called Virtual Box that is like in Linux. Um, this might not be what I'm talking about, but uh, why is migration restricted to processes with the same name? You mean to say within a land? What do you mean by when you're migrating a process from one virtualization layer in one physical server to another physical server, and two physical servers don't share the same model of... CPU, you're talking about something that is uh, very specific to how VMware, etc. work, right? So, so question is, uh, this is sort of a side question really, but question is when you move a virtual machine from one server to another, there are some restrictions on what kind of server can you move it to. In specifically, I think for VMware and many other uh, virtual machine hypervisors restricted that you can move it only from one, uh, the same CPU family. You cannot do Intel to AMD for instance. Right? So I think that has to do with how the virtualization layer is set up. Because it is you are emulating, so, in, so if you had total emulation, so I think there is something mentioned, things I have not mentioned. So there are many ways to implement virtualization. Okay, one is what is called total emulation, where you emulate the entire CPU in software. Every instruction is actually being emulated in software. Okay. The other one is called para virtualization, where you actually take these instructions and you directly execute them on CPU without translation. Okay. And that is going to be much faster than taking every instruction and just emulating that instruction. Okay. In most cases, for performance reasons, you implement this virtualization for efficiency rather than full emulation. And if you do that, then you cannot just switch CPU families while the machine is running. Okay, because there will be some differences between the underlying hardware and you will not be able to deal with that and your machine will crash. Okay, so that's really the reason. So it's like a you could actually shut it down and redo some of the parameters and bring it back up. In that case, there will not be a problem. But doing it live, because it's already running, you can't change some of the parameters inside. Okay, that's sort of a coarse answer. Any other questions here? Yes, sir. Uh, so you mentioned that Many benefits of data centers, and there are just a couple more slides here. Uh, data centers that use virtualization, that is. Okay, so now we are trying to put those two concepts together. So this is a rack of servers. Okay, and uh, so the way typically companies use virtualization uh, is to do what they call consolidation, server consolidation. Okay, so this is a typical example is as follows. Let's say you have a rack of old machines that are five years old. Time to replace them. Okay. Old method was for every old machine, buy a new machine. And then just migrate the application to the new machine. I mean, take a weekend, shut everything down, move the code, move the data to the new machine, bring it up. Okay. And then you are basically at the end of the week or the, the, the Monday, you basically machines are back up, applications are moved to another machine. Clearly, if you buy a new machine that uh, that's replacing a five-year-old machine. You can imagine that that new server is going to be a lot more fa uh, faster, a lot faster than the old one. It will have more cores, more memory, it will be faster. Okay? So, uh, so it basically, you don't really have to take one old machine and replace it with a new machine. Okay? You have a lot more capacity of the new machine. So what some companies do is they will take applications that are sitting on maybe four old machines and try to put all of them on one new machine because there's enough capacity. Let's say all your five-year-old machines were uniprocessors. Now I buy an eight-core server. Okay. Clearly, well, the application that ran fine on a uniprocessor doesn't certainly need eight cores. It would be fine with one of those cores and still run okay. So it's fine to take several applications or several servers and then move them to one new, but bigger server. 
the easiest way to do this is virtualization. What you will do is on this server, you will run a virtual machine hypervisor. Right? For every old server, you will actually create a virtual machine. Right? Inside that virtual machine, you will install the same OS that was run. You don't even have to change the OS. And then the same OS, it could be an old OS, that's okay. You run the same OS, same application, and just basically take that bigger machine and slice it. Maybe there are four cores, or in this case, let's say there are six virtual machines that are being sourced. You can take six old servers, throw them out, put all of those apps on one big server, and then you can take the cores and just map them to the server, to the <coughs> virtual machine, and you're done. Right? This process, as I just described, is called consolidation. Right? You're consolidating or uh, taking some old servers and packing those OSs and uh, applications into one bigger box more capable box. Okay. And virtualization helps you do that easily. Yeah, because if you create virtual machines and you just migrate, you don't even have to change the OS because you are emulating, you can run the same OS, same code, etc. Okay. Over time you can upgrade, but you don't have to do it just because you bought a new box or a new server. Okay. So these kinds of advantages have actually led to data centers using virtualization more and more. So, so you have old racks getting replaced by three new machines and they're still faster performance. Okay. That's one case, uh, uh, use case. Another use case for data centers is what is called virtual desktops. I don't know if you heard of virtual desktops. Okay. What happens in a virtual desktop is you take your PC, okay, the whatever your disk is, and you take that entire disk and you run it in a virtual machine on some server somewhere. And you then connect to, uh, you use what is called a thin client to connect to that PC using a protocol like VNC or remote desktop connection or some such thing. It's kind of return to terminals back in the day. So this is like the old uh, days of terminals. This is called thin client computing. Okay, your front end node is, doesn't need to be very capable. It can be a thin client. Okay. Now, if you are a programmer, you probably wouldn't be given a thin client. Uh, but if you are uh, doing a checkout at a supermarket, that checkout terminal doesn't need to be a high-end PC. It can be a thin client where the actual code is running somewhere on a data center and you are just scanning products that somebody is buying and just printing out bills and so on and so forth. Okay. So the reason this is useful is if all the PCs, uh, virtual PCs in this case, are in a data center somewhere, it is much easier for maintenance. Right? Suppose new software patch came out some software vulnerability. If you have to go to every one of your stores and take every terminal and upgrade it, that's going to take a lot of effort. Right? But if all of these machines are sitting in one machine room somewhere, you just go there and you can upgrade them all because they are all right there. Okay, so, so this is another trend in the industry that is using virtualization where you take desktops uh, and turn them into thin clients and put all the disk code and all the, all the OSs on the data center somewhere and then just use a protocol to just do uh, screen sharing. You have to do things differently on you know, data center. So you need to make sure that your server resources are being used efficiently. Uh, applications may have workloads that keep changing. Uh, you need to basically figure out how to deal with those things automatically. Right? So I talked about live migration. In many cases, you let the data center software automatically figure out uh, which virtual machines to run on what server. If load goes up on one ma virtual machine, you move it to another less loaded server automatically. You don't have a human person going saying that machine is overloaded, so I'm going to move. So a lot more automation and intelligence is actually built into data centers, okay, just to make the task of managing them easier. Otherwise, you'll need an army of 500 people to just my IT administrator to manage a data center. It's very expensive. So you use more, lot more automation. Okay? So that's one side of the story, which is just resource management employs a lot more automation. The other side of it is energy efficiency, okay, which I did not really talk about at all, but it's an important issue. Okay? I said typical data centers consume a lot of electricity. Okay? The one I was showing you in Holyoke consumes 20 megawatts. Not yet, because there are no machines in there, but eventually when there are machines, it will consume 20 megawatts. Yeah, that can power easily several hundred homes. Okay. The Google data center consumes hundreds of megawatts, and so does Apple's data center. Okay. So, 
uh, and think of the energy bill. They run into you get electricity bill that's millions of dollars a month. Okay, so that's not a small amount of money even for large corporations. So they want to make these data centers very energy efficient. Okay? Typical thing that is done is at night time when the load is low, you will actually start shutting servers down automatically. Okay? I think of Gmail. A good example of a data center. Gmail is a cloud or a data, the server runs in data center. Typically load on Gmail servers is, is higher during the day than the night because there are fewer people checking email at night than day. You keep all those servers running at night, they are just going to consume electricity but not do any useful work. They are just running there, nobody is accessing mail and stored. Okay, so what you can do is then basically shut some of those machines down. So that you don't need all of them to be up to handle them. And when during the day you can shut, turn more of them back up. Okay? So you can do things like that to reduce your electricity. Okay? Now the thing you have to deal with is if you shut a machine down, you don't want to make the data unavailable. Okay? Because your client might just wake up at 3 a.m. and say, I need to check my email. Okay? And then if you say, your server is down, come back at 6 a.m., doesn't work. Okay? So you want to ensure that you do all of this without making the data unavailable. So you have to make multiple copies of the data and have at least one server up that can still let you access the data. Yes, the school I used to go to, their version of Spire would shut off at midnight and reopen at 7 a.m. Okay, yes. That's not ideal. <laughs> you could force it on your consumer. Say, you know that? Thou Sorry, shall not close. check email at night or thou shall not register for a close at night. But, uh, but that's not ideal. You don't, you don't want to enforce such artificial restrictions, people don't like it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you want to design these, uh, so you, uh, you can be more energy efficient, but it is going to make your system more complicated. So if you start turning off servers, you want to make sure that whatever service it was running is still going to provide whatever uh, service request. You can't say server down, right? So, that, so, so you want to basically uh, ensure energy efficiency without impacting what is called availability. Availability essentially means can you access your data, is it available? Okay. So that will typically mean you employ replication, you create multiple copies, so you turn off one server but the other one is still there just in case somebody decides. Okay. So a lot more challenging uh, challenges in designing your applications. Okay. So I'll end, yes, question. In the case of a big company like Google, what would they have multiple data servers like in other countries to handle yes. their so I didn't mention this. So typically if you take any large company, Google, Microsoft, they will have lots of data centers and in multiple countries. Okay, so yeah, so you'll have a US data center, a European one, not just one, but many in the US and many in uh, okay, so Europe and should, so on. Yeah, that kind of one place could be Yes, exactly. Right. So you will, yes. If you have global clients, there is no night and day. When it's night for you, it's day for someone else, right? So. So, and they will be careful enough, they will actually check where you are coming, where you are accessing your data from and put your data in the right data center. So, it's closer to you. You make all your Asian clients access data from the US, it's going to be slower for them. So, they will do all of this automatically. That's another thing that you have to do, which I didn't mention here. Yes. Okay, so last thing here before we wrap up just a second. This is just a pie chart that shows you uh, typical running cost of a data center. Okay, so uh, the red part of this is electricity, uh, not electricity, that's cooling infrastructure cost or air conditioning, that is your electricity bill and this is really the server side of it. Okay, so you will see that uh, the air conditioning and cooling part of your data center costs as much as servers, roughly as much. Right, so, so if you, if you think you want to buy 10 servers, and each server costs thousand dollars. So don't think that the total cost is actually ten thousand. You have to invest almost ten thousand dollars to cool your machines. And that's typical round rule of thumb in this case. Yes. So what exactly is that like cost coming from? Like the fact that it's like the power just to run the servers, or just like um, this is basically the cost. of so this let think of this as the air conditioning and so on, air conditioning, the servers and the networking and all of that. This is the cost of putting in a large air conditioner to cool that thing. This is the cost of electricity bill. Okay. So like I, I still don't understand what the cost of the service actually is and like why. Like cost of the server, cost of buying, buying the server. Three year per 
server. Okay, so it's just, just, just a one time thing. You're not paying for like one month. Maintenance. Right. No. So, you, but you do have maintenance and so on. It's not that you buy the server, you have to buy warranty and you do lots of other things. So, there is some what is called upfront investment as recurring cost, right? So, uh, the, the cost by the air conditioner, electricity is recurring cost. Here, you have maintenance. So, I didn't show all of it. I mean, there are lots of costs if you actually look at. But just to give you an example of how you build a data center where the money goes actually. Right. So yeah. And I mean you could it says three year server amortization. So based on that what they're doing is they're taking your initial server cost okay. and they're saying we're gonna have to rebuy all of these in three years. Okay. So, okay. so how cycle. much does it cost each month assuming that we keep them all for three years? Okay. All and right. then for fifteen year for infrastructure, so networking probably and cooling definitely. Yeah, so